Welcome to United Body of Christ Church, an online ministry where it is our mission to minister and feed the Word of God to the body of Christ. Visit our website at ubcchurch.org where we offer free full-length video and audio Bible study lessons taught verse by verse. Select a speaker, topic, or series and click filter to view the Bible lesson of your choice. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along with each verse by scrolling to the bottom of each Bible study video. If you are in need of prayer, you can visit our website and fill out the prayer request form. Please be sure to indicate if you would like your name added to our online prayer list page. And most importantly, please indicate if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We also ask that you visit the prayer list and pray for our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Last but not least, the United Body of Christ app is available in the Google Play Store and your iPhone app store. Let us now join Pastor Clarence for today's Bible study lesson. Well, God bless you, saints, citizens, and soldiers of the Most High God. My name is Clarence, and I'm pastor of United Body of Christ Church, which is an online ministry. On behalf of my family and myself, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you, to welcome you and your families back to another broadcast, another Bible study. Uh, today we are coming at you with Jeremiah chapter 44 and Jeremiah chapter 45. I don't see us going any further than that. Uh, I think there's enough food on the plate to have to consume uh, just in Jeremiah 44 and all, of, all within its own self. So I'm looking, actually looking forward to the Bible study. Wanted to cover this chapter uh, last recording, but I didn't think that time... Uh, uh, would work in our favor for it because we have to give it the time that it needs. And this is really a real heavy chapter to cover. Uh, nevertheless, uh, before we get into our, our Bible study, we always like to go before the Lord in prayer. Amen. Our Father, thou art in heaven, and hallowed be thy name. Thine kingdom come. Thine will be done upon this earth as your will is done in heaven. Father, we ask that you would give us this day that we would have our daily bread. We also ask that you would forgive us of our sins, of our trespasses, of our debts, of our transgressions, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the hands of the evil one. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, it's the power and the glory, forever and ever in Jesus' name we pray. Father in heaven, we come before you this day, bow down heads, humbled hearts, hungry spirits, ready to come before you, ready to sit and, cons and commune with you, to fellowship, to learn, to worship you in spirit and in truth, to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may take in this manna, this living bread, this living word. Jesus, we thank you for giving us access to your Father's throne. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the keys to the kingdom, our citizenship there as well. Lord Jesus, thank you for being the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us power over sins, as well as our names being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We thank you for the sacrifices that you've uh, put towards us, towards our salvation. We thank you for the things that you endure, that you've endured on our behalf. We also thank you for interceding for us as you're there in heaven. You are our high priest there in heaven. Jesus, thank you for the gospel, for sending us your Father's spirit, for developing our relationship between the Father and ourselves. Jesus, thank you so much. 
Father, here we are this day, getting ready to take in this word, looking to draw close, looking to be strengthened and renewed in hope and in faith, looking to be faithful, looking, Father, for you, that we may draw near and remain in your presence. We give thanks to you, O oh Lord, that you would have allowed us, that you've let us to see another day, to breathe, to think, to rise, that our eyes would open, that our ears would hear, that our mouths would bring forth praise unto a true and living God. You give us the testimony that declares how good you are. For, Father, we are living witnesses who testify how good you are, how good you are to us individually and collectively, how good you are to this world and to the galaxy in which we live in. You are a sovereign and the sovereign king of the universe. You watch over our families, our children, our, our children's children, our neighbors, our co-workers. You watch over us. You see to it that we have those things that we need, every resource at our disposal that we could overcome so that we could come over. These things we give you thanks. We express our gratitude, our thanksgiving towards you. We declare the truth that you're the only wise, true God, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, that holy thing of Israel. I thank you, Lord, that you would allow us, even the Gentiles, to come and seek your face and to discover your ways that we may apply them. I give thanks to you, O oh Lord, for monitoring our comings in and our goings out, for establishing our well-being and our peace, giving us a a holy fellowship and camaraderie one with another, love and compassion and mercy and grace, even understanding of this word of God. I thank you. I thank you for the path that you've placed all of us on this day, that path that leads to your throne, that path that leads to the gates of heaven, that path that leads to eternal life. I thank you for long suffering and being so merciful and being full of loving kindness towards us. You are abundant in goodness. You are wise counsel. You are knowledge and understanding. You are meats and drinks. You are life and light. You are joy and peace. You are power, Lord. You are he that leads us that we may prosper and be successful in this world and in the world to come. We give you thanks, O oh Lord. His holy, eternal majesty, we give you thanks because you're worthy. You're worthy to be feared, worthy to be reverenced, to be adored, to be loved, to be cherished oh god i thank you for the for the god that you are the god whom we serve the things that you allow us to so richly enjoy those things of heaven the joy and peace love strength and power thank you for making them available for us lord god to so richly enjoy thank you thank you so much Thank you for the separation from this world into the kingdom. Thank you, Lord. Help us to receive this word today. Help us to bear its understanding that we may draw near. Father, let this word be the power that's needed to break and dispose of the shackles that we've been hooked up to, Lord, that we would be free and liberated of that mindset that was rebellious against you. Help us to have that mind in Christ 
let that mind be also within us, Lord. I thank you for this word. I thank you for the opportunity to, to feast with you, to sup, to commune, to fellowship, to just be in your company and in the company of my brothers and sisters. God, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for the platform and the work that you assigned us within your vineyard. To God be the glory, Father, for we work on your behalf. To minister on your behalf. To God be the glory, for you alone are worthy. You are worthy. We thank you for the indwelling of your Holy Spirit in the midst of calamity, in the midst of viruses, you give us peace and hope. You comfort us. You comfort our children. And I thank you for such things, God. You answer our prayers. You receive them and you address them. You even give us the unction to come speak to you concerning those things that concern us. To these things, we say thank you. You give us the patience, the holiness to endure in the world that is full of dark and turmoil, in the world that is obviously lost without you. I thank you, Lord. Your government is the government. You rule and you reign. And I thank you. I thank you for the saints of God. I thank you that Jesus prepared a place for us, that where he is, we would be there as well. God, I thank you for such things. Your spirit dwelling inside of us and the angels gathering around us. I thank you for these things, the understanding of the word of God. Thank you, Father. Thank you for our health. Thank you for our camaraderie the longevity of our lives, the longevity of our marriages, the unity of our families. I give thanks to you. Making us whole every whit that you would give us an appetite to desire the word of God and to be nourished and strengthened by it. I give thanks to you, O oh Lord, because you're worthy. You are worthy. You are holy. You are tried and true. Who oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You are always good. And I thank you for it. Thank you for being so generous. So merciful. In Jesus name we pray this prayer. Amen. Again folks we are coming at you with Jeremiah chapter 44 and Jeremiah chapter 45. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Um, Jeremiah chapter 44 is full of content that we really need to get into. And I won't delay you any longer. The, as, we are, as we honor the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, we honor by saying God is the chef, the bread that God has prepared for all of us to break and to receive. It is the word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, that bread of life. Amen. The Holy Spirit has invited your family and yourself, my family and myself, that we could come together at this hour, that we can sit, that we could commune, that we can fellowship. My wife and myself, uh, well, also my children, because our children are incorporated into the, the building of the ministry as far as uh, getting things together for our broadcast and then the breaking down of things. Um, my family and ourself and myself, our job is to serve what God himself has prepared for all of us to receive. So again, that's our way here at UBC Church of honoring the Father, the Son the Holy Spirit. Without any further ado, let's eat in Jesus name. This is Je Jeremiah chapter 44. We have a theme. It's called the remnant and we're going to see that play out throughout this chapter. So uh, it's called the remnant. I'm going to 
I think I'll read the scriptures related to the theme and then we'll get right into the Bible study. So hold your place in Jeremiah 44 verse 1 and let's go to Exodus chapter 32 verses 7 through 14. Exodus chapter 32 verses 7 through 14. And again, uh, this is our uh, theme of today. The theme is called the remnant. Exodus chapter 32 verses 7 through 14. And here's what the word of the Lord says. And when Moses saw, and I'm sorry, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, because Moses was, was there communing and fellowshipping with God in Mount Sinai, the people gathered, to, gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Go up. It says, uh, I'm sorry, they said, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as, this, for as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. So Moses was gone for, I think, 40 days and, and some 40 nights that he was out of presence of the people. And the people began to worry because he wasn't there. So what do they do? Uh, they go back to their idolatrous ways. And the man of God that was left in charge they began to, to persuade him to help them to carry out um, their idolatry, if you will. Uh, they, 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 they persuaded him uh, to help them to take part in, uh, in the worship of idolatry and false gods and various things of that sort because Moses wasn't available for them at that time. So they resorted back to those things that they were familiar with, what was already in them to do. And Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings, which, which are in your, the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and they brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at, the hand, at their hand, and he fashioned it uh, with a graven tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So uh, they go back to idolatry. Remember, they came out of Egypt. And, and it was in, in, in Egypt that they learned this idolatry, these, the worship of these false gods and pagan images, if you will, pagan pagan uh, 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 sculptures and various things of the sort. They learned these things in Egypt, and they were familiar with that. Okay, Look at this. And Aaron, when he saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast unto the Lord. Okay, And they rose up early on the morrow, and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink, and they rose up to Play. And when you begin to look up um, the extent of what their playing was, they were involved in various sexual orgies. That's what they we, they got up to play. These are things that they picked up in, in Egypt. Again, this is going to go along with our theme today, that everything is going to tie in. But they learned these things in Egypt. And notice how the man of God is still wanting to have some ways to, to, to pacify the Lord, but then also he wants to pacify the people. He wants to incorporate the, the ways of the world ver and integrate that into the ways of the kingdom. He wants a feast unto the Lord, but then also he wants to integrate these pagan customs. So it makes me wonder, which Lord are you really worshiping? Because there's only one true Lord. Okay, he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So it makes me wonder: Did the, was the man of God compromised so uh, that he it wasn't the one true God that he was after? That he was only adhering to those that came out of Egypt. Now, going on with this, because this this is this all going to tie into our lesson today. So they rose up early on the morrow, they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat, drink, and they rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, and this is what we need to pay attention to, this gets real. And I wanted to read this verses 7 through 14, but it behooved us to read everything here. Look at what this says here. The Lord said unto Moses, get, go, get thee down, for thy people which thou hast broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. 
Okay? They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I've commanded them. They've made them a molten calf and have worshipped and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I've seen this people. And behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them and I will make thee a great nation. This is that part that we just read, I will make thee a great nation. Moses is going to go into why God is, God is saying that I want to just wipe them all out and I'm going to uphold my word. And I'm going to use you as a remnant, a potter with some clay, and I'm going to make sculptures out of you. I'm going to bring seed out of you so that I can keep my word. We're talking about that remnant. Look at what he says to Moses, and I'll reread verse 10. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them, and I will consume them, and I will make thee a great nation. God is wanting to make a nation out of Moses because he's going to keep his word. He's got he's he's after this remnant, if you will. Now, here's Moses' response. Moses begins to intercede for the people. Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy why doth thy wrath wax hot against the people which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains, and to consume them from the, from the face of the earth? Turn from the fierce wrath, and repent of the evil against the people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thine servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and this is the word, this is that promise, and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. So there's this remnant that God wants to have so that he can fulfill his promise. The promise is that I'm going to multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. In order to do that, you've got to have something to work with. So God is always trying to preserve that remnant. And at the time that he was going to wipe the children of Israel off the face of the earth, he was going to use Moses as that remnant to, to pour seed out of him so that he can maintain his promise. What is his promise? I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And then the second half of the promise, and all this land I have spoken of will I give unto your seed and they shall inherit it. We need this information as we're constantly reading uh, the book of Jeremiah while God allows his wrath to consume them, but not all of them because he needs this remnant. He wants this remnant. He wants this remnant there so that he can maintain his promise. And there was a two-part promise to make sure that the seed multiply as the stars of heaven and to make sure that they have that land that he promised them. So he's always looking to bring them back to that land so that his promise is always fulfilled. And finishing up here, verse 14, for, verse 14 the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. So that's that. Again, our theme today is the remnant. And now that you have that, Let's go ahead and read Jeremiah chapter 44 and, and see the, the, uh, um, the detail of events that begin to unfold there. And you can see, having that information in Exodus, you get a chance to see God's approach to, to the, the events or situations that presented themselves before him. Amen? So Jeremiah chapter 4, 44 verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews which dwelt in the land of Egypt, which dwelt at Migdal and at Tophanes and at Noph, in the country of Pathros, saying, now this is the word, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Ye have seen all the evil that are brought upon Jerusalem and upon all the cities of Judah. And behold, 
this day they are desolations. They are a desolation and no man dwelleth therein. Because of their wickedness which they've committed to provoke me to anger in that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they knew not, neither they, yea, nor your fathers. Howbeit, I sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate. But they hearken not, nor incline their ears to turn from their wickedness to burn incense unto other gods. Wherefore my fury and my anger was poured forth, was kindled in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, and they are wasted and desolate as at this day. Therefore now, thus saith the Lord, the Lord God, the God of hosts, the God of Israel. Wherefore commit ye this great evil against your souls to cut off from you man and woman, child and suckling, out of Judah to leave you none to remain. There's a couple things here. God gives the example. When, this, is, this is the powerful thing here. Look at this. He gives the example. He says, I've made these places desolate because of what they've done. Look at what he says. Um, because of their wickedness in verse 3, which they've committed to provoke me to anger, in that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they knew not, neither they, yea, nor their fathers, nor your fathers. In verse 6, wherefore my fury and my wrath was poured forth and was kindled in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem, and they are wasted and desolate as they are as at this day. That's now. What do we have before us today? We have a Bible. And what are we reading about? We are reading about events that have taken place, those things that people have done to provoke God to wrath. And as we're reading, we're learning what to do and what not to do. God has recorded the events and placed them before us because he is unchanging. What's different now is that we have the Lord Jesus Christ that's buying us some time, that's atoning for our sins and giving us some grace. But that same wrath that the children of Israel had to contend with then is the same wrath we're going to have to contend with now once that grace expires. Okay? Now, stay with me because I'm going somewhere here. So, we have the manuscript. We have the the, uh, the the writings of the series of events that culminated that brought forth the wrath of God. It, it called and begged and beseeched God that he could send his wrath. And God answered the call and he sent his wrath. We have the series of events which led up to it. Guess what God did to them? This remnant that he's speaking to. He gave them a series of events. He broke down the same way that we're breaking down the series of events that led to the demise that caused the land to be desolate and brought upon destruction. God has told those that remained that, uh, check out how you got here. A plus B gave you C. Basically, God has given them a Bible somewhat, if you can follow me. God has given them a, 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 a detailed series of events so that going forward, they can look over the past. In this case, it's still part of their present, but they'll be able to look over things and say, okay, let me not make this with the life, since my life has been spared because desolation has happened, destruction has happened. Now that my life has been spared, let me look over things to see how things have come to be so I know not to take those same destructive paths that I've taken in, in before. That's why God is breaking these things down to them. He's giving them somewhat of a manuscript or a Bible and saying they worshiped other gods. I couldn't keep still. Eventually, I said my wrath and they've got consumed. 
That's what happened. The look at, and, it, and it happened to your land and it happened to you. We begin to look at the scripture and the reason why we have our Bible studies because we want to draw close to God. We want to know about those things that offend God and we want to, we want to know about those things that please God for our benefit and not our detriment. God gives them the knowledge and the understanding for their benefit and not their detriment. It's up to them to choose which path they want to take. We have the same opportunities that he's given the people that we're studying about right now. They have every opportunity to be saved as we're reading this. They had it even when desolation came and they were spared. When his wrath fell upon the land and they were spared. Then they had an opportunity to make things right. And God rehearsed the, the series of events that came before them that brought them into the point that, to which they find themselves into. But they still chose not to repent. And God called them out on it. Now, what are, why are we discussing that? Because when God lets you off the hook, so to speak, when he begins to spare you, for your rebellious, destructive, and decisive ways. He's giving you that opportunity out of his grace and his mercy so that you can see where you went wrong and that you don't travel down that same path because the next time he might not be so sparing, okay? We get an opportunity to, to examine things. God places it before us, and then he gives us an opportunity to take responsibility for it. Look at what he says in verse 7. Therefore now thus said the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, wherefore commit ye this great evil against your souls to cut off from you man and woman, child and suckling, out of Judah to leave none to remain. God is saying, why would you put yourself in that situation? That I wouldn't do this to you. This is what you're doing to yourself. Why would you do this to you? Why would you do this to your people? Why would you do this to your nation? Why would you do it to your generations? Why would you do it when you know what kind of God that I am? When you know that you have to whatsoever a man sow, there shall he also we. We have to stop looking at what people caused us to do. And I don't glorify the devil. I don't glorify the enemy whatsoever. He's going to, God is going to deal with him when the time comes. But people say the enemy made me do it. The enemy this, the enemy that. God is not putting the blame on the enemy. God said, why would you go and do the things that you're doing that you would bring danger and destruction on your people, your family, your old and your young, your infants? Why would you do that? Your generations, even your land, why would you allow these things to happen? And you got to stop blaming other people. God said, you brought this on yourself. We read these things for our understanding so that we don't take the same path and so that we take responsibility for what we've done so that we don't go back and do it again. Because when you keep blaming others and not taking responsibility for your own actions, you're going to end up in the same, if not the worst situation all over again. Amen? Well, this is pretty heavy. Again, we're still talking about the remnant because all of these things are going to come together. But I wanted to show you that in the scripture, how God was giving them somewhat of a history lesson or a Bible or a manuscript, whatever you want to call it, as to what had happened and what's, what's going to continue to happen. He, died, he detailed all the events to let them know how, how they got to where they are. And what their participation in it, you know, how they participated into the things that came upon them. And we have the same opportunity as they are to choose the path that God sets before us. Either the path of eternal life or destruction. Amen. I digress. Let's go on with this because we're going to tie everything. We're talking about the remnant. We're going to tie everything together. So God says in verse 8, In that you provoke me unto wrath with the works of your hands, burning incense unto other gods in the land of Egypt, whether you be gone to dwell, that you might cut yourselves off, that ye might be a curse and a reproach among all the nations of the earth. You know the kind of God that I am. You know I'm long-suffering and patient, 
but my patience has a limit. And you know what brings desolation and destruction. Why would you go to Egypt to think that you're going to be away from me, that I'm not going to see what you're doing over there? And that I'm not going to hold you accountable when you were living on the land of, in the land of Judah? You think because you relocated to the land of in, uh, Egypt that you can go and do what you want to do and I'm still not going to have issues with it? <laughs> God is... This is, some heavy, this, this is a heavy, heavy chapter. He goes on and God says that you're provoking me to, to this anger. You're provoking me to this wrath, right? Verse 9, have you forgotten the wickedness of your fathers and the wickedness of the kings of Judah and the wickedness of their wives and your own wickedness and the wickedness of your own wives, which they've committed in the land of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? They are not humbled, even unto this day. Neither have they feared, nor walked in my laws, nor in my statutes that I set before you and before your fathers. Therefore, thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will set my face against you for evil and to cut off all Judah. Now, that is a heavy word. We want God to set his face towards us for good and not against us for evil. We want him to watch our comings ins and, and our goings outs. But when we openly rebel against him, when we despise him, when we reject his word and we reject his ways, we reject his mandates and his precepts, his ordinances, when we choose to not observe those things, can we call on him to bless us? Because we're actually calling on him to curse us and not bless us. Our ways are speaking before our mouths do how we feel about God. Message received, right? And that's why we, we, we go through these Bible studies and we go and the Lord leads us through these chapters because he is an unchanging God. And if we come after him as Gentiles, believers, you know, through the faith of Abraham and by the blood of Jesus, if we come after him this way, then we have to look at the examples that was set before the children of Israel. And we have to be able to understand who we worship and who we serve. You know, what kind of God he is. You know, what, what provokes him to anger? And what, what encourages him to embrace us? That word is a bad word, encourages to use, but it's for lack of any other word at, at this time. But what, you know, what pleases him concerning us and what, what uh, 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 provokes him to anger concerning us. Okay? So this is our Bible study. This is why we get a chance to read these things. And this, this is some heavy stuff. This is some, but it, it's going to get deeper than this. And I'm, you can see I'm excited about having to read this because this is some heavy things. This is some heavy stuff here. Uh, so God says, have you forgotten the wickedness of your fathers? And he began to put people on notice individually and collectively. Look at what he says here. Have you forgotten? And well, we've already read it, but if you would entertain me, allow me to reread this. Have you forgotten the wickedness of your fathers, the wickedness of the kings of Judah, the wickedness of their wives, and your own wickedness? So you can see he's putting people on notice collectively and individually. But then watch this. And the wickedness of your own wives, which they have committed in the land of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. They are not humbled even unto this day. Neither have they feared nor walk in my laws nor my statutes that I set before you and before your fathers. Therefore, thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will set my face against you for evil to cut off all of Judah. Now, we know that all of Judah won't be cut off because God speaks about the remnant. There is always a remnant. Amen. Keep that in mind. Just as we read to open up our Bible studies, how we were in Exodus and how God says that he will make a, a, a great nation out of Moses. God is speaking about this remnant. I, I'm going to take a piece out of you 
and sow it into the earth that as this nation comes forth. And I need this peace in order to bring forth this nation. I need this remnant, you know. And God talks about this. So well, let's continue to read because this gets real interesting. Watch verse 12. I will take the remnant of Judah that, I've set their, that have set their faces to go into the land of Egypt to sojourn there. And they all shall be, or they shall all be consumed and fall in the land of Egypt. They shall even be consumed by the sword and by the famine. And they shall die from the least even unto the greatest by the sword and by the famine. And they shall be an ex execration and an astonishment and a curse and a reproach. So this remnant that was spared from the previous destruction, the desolation that fell upon the people and the land, they took, they, they got, they um, chose to go into Egypt. So remember, they were first being uh, forced, the children of Israel, the children of, Ju the children of Judah, the people of the land of Jerusalem, they were first being forced, uh, they were first being forced to flee uh, because of what Ishmael did uh, to Gadaliah. Uh, remember that. And um, Johanan came and rescued uh, those that were being forced. But after he rescued them, uh, they didn't want to stay in the land of Jerusalem because they were afraid. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't want to stay in the, in the territories of Judah, I should say, because they were afraid uh, of the blowback that they were going to get from the Babylonians with Gadaliah being dead, uh, being killed, if you will. So they chose to go into Egypt and they were warned about going into Egypt. So now we're finding out, we're going to find, we're finding out and we're going to find out that not only were they afraid to stay, but they also had desires to go and into the land of Egypt because they got a chance to serve other gods. We get a chance to see that the kings uh, 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 of, of, of Judah, we get a chance to see that, that the governments, we get a chance to see that society as a whole and then each individual person were caught up in idolatrous ways. So now that the, there's this destruction in Jerusalem and in the lands of, of Judah, now they want to go into Egypt, whereas they can still continue in their idolatry. Do you remember when we read in Exodus how they took these golden calves, they took the earrings and they, they, they uh, uh, melted them down to, to form this Golden. They, those are idolatrous ways that they received when they were in Egypt. So look, now all of a sudden they want to go back into this land of Egypt to where they can still uh, uh, practice pagan worship and idolatry. This is what's happening in society today. A lot of people migrate into this country and a lot of people elect people in power that's going to allow them to still express those things that are inside of them. What did the people do when, when Moses was, was gone away? They went and, they, they went and got uh, Aaron and they, they allowed Aaron or they, they persuaded Aaron to compromise himself. Okay? People will elect officers and governments and kings and what have you to express who they are. What's going on on the inside, people vote for them on the outside and they want people to pass laws to allow them to still have that quality of life, whether good or bad, to exemplify who they are on the inside. You cast your vote according to what you want as far as your lifestyle to be like. So you put people in place so that they can help you obtain that. In this case, they had governments and, and kings and, and so on and so forth to help them to do those things that they wanted to do. And when that got wiped out, they decided to go into another territory so, they de so that they wouldn't abandon this, this lifestyle that they've been so accustomed to. And I tell you that that's what's going on today, even in our own country, in our own world. That people, 
put governments there, uh, uh, elect officials there, and you want you, you you want to have this society the way that you're accustomed to having it. I'll give you an example, and it's going to sound political, and I don't mean to sound that way, but this is just how I see the the the, the you know the spirit of things. You got a lot of people that's leaving out of California. And then they're migrating over to to Texas. And the customs, there's are total different lifestyles of Texas versus uh, uh, Texas versus California, California versus Texas. But if you get enough people from Texas going to California, all of a sudden those lifestyles begin incorporated and begin to incorporate into to California. If you get enough people from California into Texas, all of a sudden their way of life begins to incorporate into Texas. Where where a bunch of people go, they take their ways with them. And they they come into a place that's going to allow them to openly express what's going on inside of them, you know? And that's what you're starting to see in in a lot of our states and a lot of our governments. That's what you're starting to see. Well, this is what you were seeing. Now, they had already had Egypt in them. God been trying to get Egypt out of them for years. Okay, he been trying to for decades, for centuries. <laughs> but they so close to Egypt, they go and they mimic all of these Egyptian ways. So now, where we are today, people will go to where they can express themselves. They will elect leaders to allow them to express themselves. And if, if leaders were installed or voted or appointed into offices that people can no longer express themselves or have that, uh, uh, that quality of life that they've been so accustomed to, they will go somewhere else to find where they can be themselves and not have to compromise by putting up with someone else's uh, mandates that, go, that conflicts with, 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 what, with what they want and who they are. Okay, so in this case, uh, as we're reading in our Bible study, Jerusalem, the land, the territories of Judah is, is desolate. You think about Mars when you look at the pictures of Mars and how desolate it looks. Then you, you think about the, the desolation that was taking place in the territories of Judah. So what do the children of Israel do or children of Judah do? They go into uh, Egypt so that they can be who they want it to be. They can express themselves because the other the the nation of 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 uh, 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 Egypt already enjoys pagan pagan ways and idolatry, so they're right at home because that's what they've been doing in 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 the land of Judah all this time. Amen. So they're going to go to places. People will migrate to places that they can have liberty to express themselves and bring forth uh, uh, pagan ways. And they will put people in office that will accompany or accommodate uh, uh, their, their pagan ways and pagan customs. You know, And that's what's happening here. And so God, God speaks out about that. And it's real heavy too. So now here we are in uh, verse 14. So that none of the remnant of Judah which gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there shall escape or remain that they should re return into the land of Judah to the which they have desired to return to dwell there. For none shall return, but such as shall escape. So God acknowledges that the people, uh, there will be some that will escape that are called to escape because he still needs this remnant. But he also wants to make a point that instead of you repenting, of your ways after you've seen the desolation and the destruction, you go somewhere else so that you can continue to do those things that provoked me to anger. You're not interested in changing. You're not saying I've been spared or I've been given a second or third or fourth chance. Let me get my act together. Instead, you take the show on the road, right? And you go into another nation that you know is a pagan nation. Where your roots began in, in Egypt. And you go back to, you go somewhere where you can continue to do those things. And the Lord is saying, I'm going to show you 
better than I can tell you. You think that I won't follow you? You think that I'm a borderless God? You think that I'm a God that, 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 you know, that I can't breach borders? God is the sovereign king of the universe. He, he's the one that establishes borders. And if he established borders, he can cross the borders that he've established. He has the authority to establish the borders. So you go into another territory or another land and you say, I'm going to do what I want to do and God ain't going to follow me here. He is the one that established the land that you're going into. The people just got on the land and they defiled it with their idolatrous ways. And God is saying that the sword that you think you got away from in the territories of, Ju of Judah, that sword, that famine and destruction is going to be over there in Egypt as well. And the only ones that are going to escape is the ones that I need to maintain the remnant. Remember, you, we keep talking about this remnant. Verse 15, then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods and all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt and Pathros, they answered Jeremiah saying, as for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done, we and our fathers and our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals and were well and we saw no evil. Heavy, heavy, heavy. The people have finally exposed what was inside of them. They were not going into Egypt just because they were afraid of the Babylonians, but they were going so that they can be made to feel right at home. People will migrate to places and territories to where they can feel how they want to feel and express themselves and not have to be ashamed to, to open up and express themselves. They want, they want to put governments and powers in, 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 in authority to help them to, 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 to be open and, and, and to have no barriers and, and, you know, to what have you. So this is, this is heavy. I mean, they came out of their, they came out of their own mouths and said that, uh, we will not hearken unto the Lord. And you're going to have times to where, especially people that are in ministry and you're listening to this Bible study, you're going to have times to where you have to go and speak to people about, just as Jeremiah was doing, you have to go and speak to people about their lifestyles, about their lifestyle choices, and, and they're part of the body of Christ, and yet, you know, they're choosing unholy relationships. Um, they're choosing things that maybe they have a particular office that they're training for within the body of Christ. And then they find themselves being compromised in a situation that they're not looking to repent from. I've been in a situation to where I've had to talk to people before and, and express to them, hey, you can't, you can't do this. You, this is, this is, you're not going to be able to do this. Um, and, you know, and, and they've come and told me that their mind has been made up. And you have to respect that because that's a conversation that they have between, they, that's a declaration that they're making between God and themselves. And you just have to get out of the way. Amen. Once a person say that we're going to do what we're going to do when we want to do it and how we want to get it done, you can't mess with that. You have to leave that alone. That, that, be, that comes between God and that person. You just got to make sure that they're not involved in any of the uh, 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 services so that that little leaven don't leaven a whole lump. But you have to take your hands out of the situation because they've made... People are going to fall on their face from time to time and quite often, you know, but they're trying to make the effort to get back up and you're cleaning them off, trying to figure out what caused you to fall this time. And you're trying to get them to watch over that and be, to be more mindful, to get stronger so that they can contend for the faith. But when a person comes at you and say that we will not hearken, we're not going to obey, and it is what it is, and that's how it's going to be, you can't do nothing with that. 
you have to let them go because they, they, they said that they don't want to be held on to. So that's what you're seeing here, and that's heavy. So this is, uh, this is really heavy here. Now look, and, and so they said that don't, while we were worshiping false gods and burning, burning uh, incense to this queen of heaven, nothing had happened to us. But when we stopped doing it, all kind of stuff began to happen. Look at what they're saying here. For then had we plenty of victuals and were well, and we saw no evil. In verse 18, but since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour our drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. My wife had asked me, do I think they were reprobate? Did God turn them over to themselves? And I'm going to have to say yes. And here's why I say this. The scripture says that the Lord will send you delusion that you should believe a lie. That's that's the main course of when you know that, that you're delusional, that you can't reason this thing out, that you believe that this is how it is and, and your way is the right way, even if it goes against scripture. You believe that your way is the right way and you choose, you choose to act out on, the, on what you believe, even if it goes against scripture and the word of God. You, you, this is, and, and you'll... You'll turn, a, a tr you'll turn the truth into a lie and try to turn the lie into truth, right? Look at what they're saying here. They couldn't reason that it was God's grace and mercies that kept them at bay. God gave them space to repent, and they chose not to repent. People use God's grace and mercy as a permission slip to continue in their ways of error. Okay, because God hasn't did this, hasn't did anything here or done anything there. You think that God is okay with some things? They were so in, they were so much in error that they were believing that their worship of this false goddess allowed them to be to prosper and allowed them uh, 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 to to live at peace. And they, they would even go and say that our, our no longer being able to worship has brought this destruction. Our, our being able to no longer, our not, we're not able to go and to be involved in pagan practices and things. That is, that's what's brought this sudden destruction. They've taken the grace and the mercies of God and have rewritten <laughs> Has, has applied it to a false goddess by saying that it's because we haven't been able to worship in the way that we worship that false goddess, that's why we've seen such calamity. This is when people have been turned over to themselves because they don't make any sense anymore. They don't reason things out anymore. God is long-suffering, and he would that all repent. He don't want to condemn anybody. So he'll stand by. He'll visit you in dreams and visit you in situations and circumstances. And he keeps giving you opportunities after opportunities to repent and to change your ways. But eventually, when you're not taking the necessary steps to correct your actions, but your feet are swift towards destruction, you keep piling on and piling on. Um, I drive commercial vehicles. Okay, I've driven a bus and now I'm driving semis. When air pressure builds up in a tank, it, it constantly builds and you'll see a gauge. The gauge is going over, going over. And they want somewhere between 120 and 140 PSI. Once that one between 120 and 140 PSI, once that gauge goes between that, you will hear air pressure release. And it sounds like, you hear that. But in order to hear that sound, that pressure has to constantly build up. And then what begins to happen? It, the tanks can no longer support the air that's built up in there, so it has to release. That's why you hear that sound, that ch from from uh, uh, buses and, 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 and trucks. You'll hear that sound. That's air being released. Now, when you're looking at the wrath of God, <laughs> you're building up his wrath, constantly building up his wrath. And when it can no longer hold, 
his wrath is released. Okay, and it's it's that tank that's building up. And once it builds up, it lets loose. Okay, that's what you're seeing happening. That's what we're reading about. And they've got it twisted to think that it's because of their worship, why they their worship of and, and their participation in idolatry that they haven't experienced these things, that they haven't experienced desolation. They've got it twisted. You know, they're, they're thinking that because of their participation in idolatry that they lived in peace. No, it's God was giving you grace and mercy to try to get things together before his wrath fell upon them. And in that time of grace and mercy, they chose to continue in their ways of error. We read this so that we can apply the same structures to our life. And what I mean by applying the same structure, meaning that if we understand God's grace and mercy, we use that as an opportunity to repent from our ways, not to live in error, but to come out of error. Do you understand what I'm saying? We got to have, we got this error thinking that God need us. He'll take <laughs> for whatever plans and that and, and visions that God has for you, he'll take a remnant <laughs> and bring it to life to finish out his plan that he may have for your family or your bloodline. Okay? I mean, he gives you every opportunity to be a part of it. But you can see what went down here. These people, again, they're thinking that their ways, their pagan ways, it what is what gave them peace. The truth of the matter is their pagan ways is what brought destruction. And just because God don't respond to your sins right away don't mean that you're not building up this pressure. And once that pressure hit a certain point, it's going to be loosed and it looses in a form of his wrath. So you want to keep that gauge down. You don't want <laughs> you know, you want you don't even want to activate that gauge. You want to just keep it down. Amen. So uh uh, when we and in, in, in a commercial industry world, con driving commercial vehicles, whether when you do uh, um, an air brake test, one of the ways to get that air pressure out of that tank is to constantly fan that. that <laughs> your foot is constantly fanning the brake, and what that brake is doing is is dropping the pressure out of that air tank. Okay, and uh, that that that's an indicator to let you know. If the if the if the uh, tank and the needle is doing what it's supposed to do, but I digress. I actually contend that you can actually use that in your life. Your foot is constantly pressing this air pedal, the brake pedal, to bring that air pressure down. Your foot. You want to constantly be continuing on your way to try to do right. You you don't want to keep living in error. You want to stay consistent. You may fall. You know, from time to time. But if you didn't die, get your tail up and, and repent and go on about doing things right. Stay consistent because you're trying to keep that air pressure down. You're trying to keep that, that pressure down. And I'm speaking metaphorically so that you don't hit a certain peak and, and the wrath of God is loosed. Amen. And so people get it twisted that when when. When God doesn't respond right away uh, as though he is OK with stuff and it's his love and his compassion, his grace and his mercies. So anyway, let me get off that so that we can go on because we still got some things to cover here. So they says, uh, since we read in verse 18, since we left off from the insolence, since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we've wanted all things and I've been consumed by the sword and by famine. So when they said we wanted all things, we've been in need of things. We had plenty. When we worshiped this queen of heaven and burned incense unto her, we had plenty. But once we stopped doing that, we had a need of all things because we had nothing. And that's a problem. And, 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 and the Lord is saying that Jeremiah is going to let them know that. No, it was the Lord being merciful and kind to you and long-suffering and gracious unto you. You've got it twisted. Verse 19, when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured our drink offerings unto her, did we make our cakes to worship her and pour our drink offerings unto her without our men? So you can get a, you can get a, a um, uh, you, if you read this, 
you get a gist that the women are doing most of the talking. Now, I know I'm focusing <laughs> some of the women out there is going to have something to say. But you get the gist that it's the women doing most of the talking and it's the women that are more in the way. Okay, that seems to be a problem as we're reading the text today, right? This seems to be the problem. And what they've gone on to say is, yeah, you said that the wives were doing it. You said that the king's wives, which are the queens, were doing it. And you said that the men and the, and the wives of the men. But did not our, But as we were there worshiping the queen of heaven, weren't our husbands there too? Why are you just putting this off on us? Weren't our husbands there? You know? <laughs> so this is what you're seeing. The, commentate, the, 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 the commentary that's going on, the conversation that's going on, you got the women letting you know that you putting all the blame on us, but our dudes was right there with us. They were worshiping the queen of heaven too. You make it seem like we, we're the only problems, but you know this has been a family matter. <laughs> so I digress. This is a, this is a, 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 this is some some chapter to read here. This is a good one. Verse twenty. Then Jeremiah said unto all the people, and to the men, and to the women, and to all the people which had given him that answer saying, the incense that you burnt in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers and your kings and your princes and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them and came it not into his mind? So, did, you're saying that burning the incense, all the people, all y'all standing in agreement and on one accord, you're saying that all of those things were perfectly well. Well, if it were well, then why did God have such a problem with it? Because he is the one that brought destruction upon you. If what you were doing was so well with him, then why do you find yourselves in desolation and in destruction? So that the Lord could no longer bear because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which you've committed. Therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without inhabitants as of this day. And Jeremiah had to set the record straight. It's not, it's not because of your work. It's the, the whole reason you find yourself in this situation is, is because of your worship towards that false God. God remembered what you were doing and it, you provoked him to anger and he couldn't no longer forbear. When those tanks, those air tanks, going back to the metaphor that I gave, that I gave when those air tanks build up, the only reason you hear that air pressure coming out is because the tanks can no longer forbear. They can't contain anymore. They have to release it. Well, that's what Jeremiah is saying, that God can no longer forbear. He couldn't, he couldn't take no more of what y'all was doing, and his wrath had to be loosed. Okay? Because you've burned incense and because you sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, nor walked in his laws, nor in his statutes, nor in his testimonies, therefore this evil has happened unto you this day. It's not because you're not worshiping the queen of heaven. It's because you did worship this false queen of heaven. Moreover, Jeremiah said unto all the people and unto all the women, hear the word of the Lord, all Judah that are in the land of Egypt. Look at this. Look at this. He said to all the women, because, he, you know, people, people, you know, we do what we can to honor the women. And of course, you need to honor your women. But there is still um, an order to things. There is still an order. And you never know if the men married these Egypt, if these women were uh, or their descendants were Egyptian. And they came out of Egypt, out of Egypt with these custom ways, and then they've moved their husbands to to worship in this manner. You never know. One would have to surmise that they, that may have been the case, you know. And and that's why the women are so offended, and so they're speaking up in the text here. The women are the ones speaking up and speaking out and say, "Was not our husbands with us as well, participating in these events? Were not they with us?" And so the women, they begin to speak out again. 
you know, and Jeremiah is, 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 is beginning to address them. As I, as I said in verse 24, moreover, Jeremiah said unto all the people and to all the women, meaning that the women were addressing him, so he began to address them as well. Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hands, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we vowed to burn incense to the queen of heaven. And to pour out drink offerings unto her, yea, uh, will surely accomplish your vows. Ye shall surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. So Jeremiah says, as the women are speaking for you concerning those things that you did, surely they're speaking for you now. And God is listening and he is going to make sure <laughs> that, that you don't get away with doing those things that your spokesperson is speaking up for you about <laughs> God is going to make sure that that gets covered. <laughs> that is, woo, that is something else here. Therefore, hear ye the word of the Lord, our Judah, that dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I've sworn by my great name, saith the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying the Lord God liveth. And let me read verse 27 so you can understand what 26 is saying. Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good. And all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by famine until there be an end of them. So what God is saying is in verse 26, he's saying that, Behold, I've sworn by my great name, said the Lord, that my name should no more be named in the mouth of any man in, in Judah. Uh, any man of Judah in the land of Egypt. Well, we know e Egypt is a land of Gentiles. It's a nation of Gentiles. So they're not the worshipers of the Lord our God. They're not the worshipers of the uh, God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. So if anybody in Egypt is worshiping the Lord our God, it's the Jews that migrated over there. So God is saying in verse 27, uh, to give you an understanding of the 26, God is saying that I'm going to go into the land of Egypt and I'm going to make sure that I, that they get dealt with so that none of them remain. And about time he gets done dealing with them, there won't be anybody in Egypt that actually is a worshiper of God or that knows God. Because we already know the nation of Egypt as a whole are a nation of Gentiles. They're not the worshiper of the Lord God that we serve. The only ones that were were the Jews that migrated into there. And God is saying because they've taken up idolatry there in Egypt, by the time he gets done dealing with them in his wrath, there won't be anyone left there that will know God by name. Amen. So that's what he's saying there. Yet a small number. Here's this remnant. We're reading about this remnant. Yet a small number that escaped the sword shall return out of the land of Egypt into the land of Judah. And all the remnant of Judah that are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there shall know whose word shall stand, mine or theirs. And this shall be a sign unto you, said the Lord, that I will punish you in this place, that you may know that my word shall surely stand against you for evil. Thus said the Lord, behold, I will give Pharaoh Hopra, king of Egypt, into the hand of his enemies and into the hand of them that seek his life. As I gave Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, his enemy, and that sought his life. So God is saying, you go over into Egypt, not only because you were scared, but because you wanted to continue in, in your idolatrous ways. And you think that I was a God that wouldn't cross over the border. Well, I'm coming after you and even in the land of Egypt to do away with you. And you thought you were escaping the sword. You thought you were escaping the war. You thought you were escaping famine by going into the land of Egypt. I've already predestined Nebuchadnezzar to come against uh, uh, the land of Egypt, to come after them for their idolatrous ways. You're going to get caught up in that blowback as well. And when, about time this whole thing is done, we'll see whose word actually came to pass. Because you're saying that the queen of heaven protected you and that's why you were worshiping her. There's none to worship and there's no queen of heaven to worship. I'm telling you that you got this thing twisted and by the time I get done, you'll see that my word prevails and not that of your own. So heavy, heavy, heavy Bible study. 
And God preserves this remnant. And why does he preserve this remnant? Because he's, he wants to maintain the word that he, the promise that he gave that we read about in, 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 in uh, we were reading about in Exodus, um, you know, that Moses reminded God of that promise um, that, that God had made to their forefathers. So that's why God is still looking to preserve this remnant. And we also learn here that we can't, just because things, if we know that we're sinning and things haven't happened to us, we use that opportunity to repent. You want to repent of your sin. And if things haven't happened, it doesn't mean that God is okay with what you've been doing. He's long suffering with you. He's being gracious and merciful unto you so that you don't perish in your sin. But there's only so much time. There's only so much patience. There's only so much grace and mercies that's going to be made available to you before he finally turn you over to yourself, before the pressure of the tank finally blows. There's only so much that God is going to endure. There's only so much he's going to forbear. So when things don't happen and you know you're worthy to receive destruction, but it hasn't happened, use that as an opportunity to repent, to stop sinning once and for all. Amen? And that's another thing that, we had, that we've gotten a chance to learn in the scriptures here, knowing that God is unchanging. He gives you time to repent. He gives you time to change. He don't destroy you right away. The problem is, is that people use that as an opportunity to embrace their sins and their rebellion and to get others involved in it. We see how society itself was broken down to where kings and queens and, 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 and family members and all were involved in, in, in unrighteousness and in unholiness. Amen? So use that opportunity to, get to, to turn from your wicked ways. Amen? Uh, let's quickly read uh, uh, chapter 45. Now, before we can read chapter 45, we actually need to go back and read uh, Jeremiah chapter, um, we need to read Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah chapter 36, verses 1 through 8. Look at what this says here. Jeremiah chapter 36, verses 1 through 8. It came to pass that in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came unto uh, Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book. And write therein the words that I've spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah and against all the nations from the day that I spake unto thee from the days of Josiah even unto the day, even unto this day. It, it may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them that, I, that they may return every man from his evil way that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. So God called God told Jeremiah that he need him to write all the prophecies and the warnings in a scroll. Okay, he want them written in a scroll. Verse 4, then Jeremiah called Baruch the son of Neriah the, and Baruch wrote the Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which had which he had spoken unto him upon the roll of a book. So Jer so so Baruch was a scribe and he wrote down all the warnings and all the prophecies that God had given unto Jeremiah. Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying that I am shut up. Well, I'm, I'm locked up. I'm, 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 you know, I'm incarcerated. I cannot go into the house of the Lord. Therefore, go thou and read in the row which thou hast written from my mouth the words of the Lord in the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the fasting day. And also thou should read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of the cities. It may be they will present their supplications before the Lord and will return every man from his evil way. For great is the anger of the fury that the Lord has pronounced against his people. Baruch the son of Neriah did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading in the book the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. So I wanted to go back and revisit that so that you will have context for chapter 45 of Jeremiah. So here's chapter 45 verse 1. The word of the Lord 
of the, the word that Jeremiah the prophet spake unto Baruch the son of Neriah when he had written these words in the book at the mouth of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim the son of Josiah the king of Judah, saying, Thus said the Lord, the God of Israel, unto thee, Baruch, Thou didst say, Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sign, and I find no rest. Thus shall thou say unto him, The Lord saith thus, Behold, that which I have built I will break down, and that which I have planted I will pluck up, even this whole land. So why is Baruch filled with this grief? Why is he filled with, with hardship in his heart? aches and pains because he knows the things that he has written down are the things he knows that it's going to come to pass he knows that these things that that he knows what the people are doing and the destruction that they're buying for they're they're, they're, they're vying for this destruction they're, they're, they're asking god please send us your wrath <laughs> these because of their unrepentant ways and it's taking a toll on him because he believes what the Lord is saying that's going to happen. And he also sees that the people are worthy to receive such destruction because of their wanting ways. He sees these things. And so he's saying, whoa, and he's filled with grief. And so God is mindful of, of what's going on inside of him. So God is saying, you won't have to contend with all that grief because it's going to happen. I'm going to light these jokers up and I'm going to make this land desolate. He says in verse 5, And seeketh thou great things for thyself? Seek them not, for behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh, saith the Lord. But thy life will I give unto thee for a prey in all the places where thou goest. God is saying, because of the destruction that I'm going to bring upon all flesh, not just the Jews, but all flesh because of what they're doing. Don't worry. Don't, or don't try to build a life for yourself here. You know, I'm going to blow this. I'm going to come after all flesh. So don't be looking. You know, in our society, we want to send our kids to college. We want, the, we want a house, a car, and a job, and a good retirement. You know, and along the way, we like to be able to obtain certain things. Men want to build decks and and uh, have their garage, their garages with their tools and their vehicles. And, you know, women have their desires that they would like to see for their homes. Men will have his desires that he want to see for his sons and his daughters, as well as the moms. They have their desires that they would want to see for their children. They have certain things that they want to accomplish, certain goals that they want to achieve. Okay, That's natural. That's the plight of men. That's what, what we are. That's how we are. That's who we are. Those things, those plans that we would make, God is saying to Baruch, these plans, these investments, these desires you have that you would want to see fulfilled, you have to put those on a back burner. Because I'm about to do something that you won't be able to fulfill those desires that you have, those plans, those long-term goals of yours that you would like to see come to pass. They're not going to be able to come to pass. But you're going to be taken care of. Because wherever you find yourself, uh, wherever you end up being at, you're going to be okay. I'm going to spare you. But don't look to invest in, in plans because there, you, I'm not going to give you the foundation to build your plans upon because I'm going to come through and wipe out some things. That's what we have to look at for ourselves. We have to look at when a society in whole rebels against God. They rebel against him. They openly and, and, and publicly turn their back upon him. And deny the Lord Jesus Christ. You're building up that pressure. And eventually it's that, that pressure is going to be released. And when it releases, it releases in this case in the form of God's wrath. And when you see society 
not repenting, not turning from their ways, but, be, but being more and more uh, uh, sinister, sadistic, unrighteous. When you see society, you know that there has to be a reckoning. Okay, there has to be a reckoning. Baruch is part of this remnant because God is saying that I'm going to spare you. You're going to be okay. You know that society is going to be judged. It's hard for us to make plans. Companies will make 5, 10, 15, 20 year plans going forward. But they never factor in God. They never factor in God visiting people for their iniquities. We factor in God. That's why we say, Lord willing, if the Lord is willing. Because you never know when God's grace is going to run out. When his compassion has met its end. You never know when that's going to happen. And so to, to not plan for that, to make plans and not factor in God's wrath, <laughs> the appointment of his wrath, Dropping at some point in time of another is real vain of us to do such things. So God was telling Baruch, I know the grief that you have about what's coming, what the people have done to deserve it, and what's coming to address it. I know your grief, and I understand it, but these things have to be so. And God is saying, don't, don't look to build, don't look to, to invest. He says, just, you know, let me be God and I'm going to do what I do. But whatever happens, you're going to be okay. That's that remnant that we've been talking about. Amen. So what do we glean from this? That at the end of the day, we have to make sure that we factor God into all of our plans. Sometimes it's better not to make plans because you never know what, you know, the ways that God's wrath will show up to hinder all your plans. You just don't know. Amen. So, Great word, great Bible study. I hope that I didn't confuse you uh, with my metaphors or what have you, but I would hope that you would understand what was going on. Amen. Eternal God, we come before you this day and we thank you for the word that was written and the understanding and the context of the word that you've given us to teach, to tell, to broadcast, to, to declare that God would be glorified, that the people would hear that they, would that they would understand your character, that we would refrain from sin, that we would not be found in idolatrous ways, but that we would worship the only wise true God. Father, help us to, re to receive, to understand, to even draw near unto you. Help, help us to seek to have your face turned towards us and not away from us. Help us to please you with our faith with our faith and to follow you through obedience. This is our desire for our, ourselves, our family, our nation. We read about the princes and the kings and the queens, you know, how they were found in, in doing things that were against you. We pray for our governments that they are found doing things that are not against you, but that are for you, that are for the kingdom of God. And if so, that they turn their backs upon you, Lord. Hold tight, hold firm that remnant that you can spare the people, those that observe thee, those who love you, those who, even if we have fallen, have gotten back up and done what we could have to not fall again, but to come after you, to repent from unrighteous ways. Remember they, remember those, thine remnant, thine children, have mercy as you have always done so. Continue to look after our well-being as you have also done so. Always done so. So we bless you and we thank you for this word. We thank you for the opportunity to present your truth to an audience uh, at home and abroad. To God be the glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. If you would go with me to Matthew chapter 11, uh, verses, uh, Matthew chapter 11, uh, we want verses 28 through 30. So Jesus invites us to be a part of the family, the sons and daughters of the Most High God. And he, he, he extends his hand, it's, extends his heart, and he 
calls out to us that we would answer him. And remember what, as we read in Jeremiah, how God said that he sends his prophets, his servants rising up early in the morning, speaking to the people. God sends his son to do the same thing, to rise up early and to speak to us, you know, to get us to change and to get us to come. And look at what the Lord Jesus says. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Obviously, the ways that we've had, the ways that we do have, don't work for us when they're not consistent with the ways and the laws of God. There, is, there becomes a conflict of interest, interest, and what happens is we find ourselves being burdened down, pressed down, weary, saddened, with a downtrodden. We find ourselves being misused, misrepresented. And, and Jesus sees that. And so he says, the first thing that I want to do is transition you from the world into the kingdom. Because in the kingdom, you know, he has more of us. In this world, he's having to contend with all of these distractions. But if he can pull us into the kingdom, then he can put the kingdom inside of us. And then we can go back into the world with the kingdom in us. But in, in order to do so... He has to pull us out of the world and pull the world out of us so that he can replace it with his kingdom. Then shall we be kingdom minded. Amen. This is when you hear that term kingdom minded. Then do we begin to obey Jesus Christ and stop doing what we see our elected officials doing, what we see our neighbors and people doing, these that have turned away from God. He has to bring us to the Father so that we would know how to begin to worship him. And we would understand who has given us that right to be called sons and daughters of the Lord God. This is why Jesus says learn of him. Because he wants us to know who our king is. Our king is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he himself has made it possible for us to be worshipers of the Lord our God. We were reading in the book of Jeremiah how the kings worship false gods. Therefore, they lead the people to do the same. Jesus, is his Father, is the Most High God. Therefore, he is going to lead us to be in worship of the Father. But in order to do so, you have to pull us out of the world and so introduce us to who our new king is, the Lord Jesus Christ, and then get us to be kingdom-minded. Then you can fill us with your Father's Spirit, fill us with the king being kingdom-minded, and now we can go back in this world being ambassadors to Christ. So he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He is inviting us to come. The choice is yours. The path is placed before you. You have to decide which path are you going to take. The path that leads to eternal life, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit? Or are you going to stay in the world and be about yourself and do those things that are rebellious against the Lord? The path is on you. This is why I say, come unto me, all ye that labor. He's given you a choice to join the family, to become sons and daughters of God. Go with me to the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 1. Go with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And let's take a look at verse, I believe it's verse 12 that we would want. Yeah, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power. To become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. So Jesus, when he says come, he is giving you an opportunity to come unto him so that he can make you a son or a daughter of God. Amen. Now, you're accepting that Jesus is king and Lord. This is how you, you have to confess it. You say, okay, Jesus, I'm going to do it your way. My way has gotten me in a world of trouble. And I want to be liberated. I want these chains broken off of me. I want these habits broken. I don't want to be in idolatry no more. I don't want to be in fornication. I don't want to be found in, adult, uh, in, in, in a, uh, an adulterous relationship. I don't want to be on these drugs. and I don't want to be, have this homosexual lifestyle. I don't want to be 
promiscuous, sleeping around. I don't want to be a thief or a murderer. I want to be saved. I don't want the wrath of God to fall on me. I don't want to be a liar. I don't want to be in sorcery. I want to be saved. I want to be that remnant that God saves. What must I do to be saved? Go with me to Romans chapter 10 and let's look at verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, you sh thou shalt be saved. What are you being saved from? The wrath of God that we've, been, that we've been talking about, that wrath that's going to fall upon mankind for their rejection and their rebellion. Hold your place there. Go with me real quick. Let's go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 36. The Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. He has an appointment with the wrath of God. He's been assigned to receive God's wrath. So when you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, what you're doing is Jesus is removing that appointment from off of you because you have an appointed time. When you were living in sin and, reliving in, and living in rebellion, you were subject to an appointed time with God's of God's wrath. But now Jesus breaks that appointment. He removes that. He takes you off of that reservation list for, for condemnation and places you on another reserve li list uh, uh, as the remnant, as, as those that are saved. Amen. So that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, meaning that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, and you're going to obey him and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So if you believe in your heart that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that you're going to obey him, he is going to save you from the wrath of God that it's still going to be poured out upon people. Remember, he told Baruch that Baruch will be saved. Well, we're going, there are going to be those that are saved that as society in itself is going to perish, there are a few that's going to be saved. And Jesus is going to save you, amen, as part of the remnant. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Meaning that if you take a chance on the Lord our God, he won't disappoint you and he won't let you down. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. As God was saving the Jews... Uh, he is also going to save the Gentiles, those that call upon the, the Lord. He is going to save you. Amen. It's not just about the salvation for the Jews, but he is going to save us too if we repent and call upon the name of the Lord and make him our Lord and Savior. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, go with me to... Um, 1 John, not the gospel, but 1 John chapter 1. Now let's take a look at verses 8 through 10. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. And here's what the word of the Lord says. And remember, we talked about taking responsibility because the people were saying that they first made a pledge to God and said to the Lord that whatever you say, we will do, whether good or bad. Then all of a sudden, the people come back and say, we won't do... Those things that God told us to do, we're not going to do them. And we're going to continue to do those very things that we pledge to do. We're going to do that. We pledge to the queen of heaven, so we're going to worship her. You know, they blatantly came out and said what they were going to do and what they were not going to do. God wants you to take responsibility for your actions. Okay? Especially when you're trying to repent. You know, you, you can't straddle the line. You can't be like one day I'm serving God and the next day you're going to serve the, the enemy. You have to choose who you're going to serve. And then if you're going to, to surrender to God, you got to give him everything. 
those things that you're trying to hide will will not work. They're going to you're giving power to those things in your life. Those shameful things that you're afraid you have to release those things over to God and confess that because if you try to hide it, you still give power to it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you need to release it over to the Lord. You need to turn away from the sin of it and then you need to let the Lord know what you've been guilty of that you're handing off to him. Because if you try to hide it and not confess it and not repent from it, you still give it power over your life and you can't have a, a, a healthy conversion uh, if you still give it place in your life. Amen. So look at what this says. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves in the truth that's not in us. If we're not honest about what's broken about us, God can't help us. If we're trying to hide it, God can help us. However, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need his forgiveness because we are not perfect. We need the blood of Jesus to atone for our sins because we mess up. If we haven't repented of our sins and we don't confess them, we're still charged with them. Do you understand what I'm saying? You may have, you may have committed a crime and you may have stopped sinning or you, you don't. You, let me put it like this. Let me give an example. Say you robbed the bank for, for back of, you know, lack of a better example. Say you robbed the bank. You used to be a bank robber, but you stopped robbing the bank. You've repented. You turned away from that. And when it comes to the kingdom of heaven, you still need to tell God about it. Even though you stopped doing it, you still need to let God know what it was that you were guilty of so that you can be forgiven of it and that you can be cleansed of the stain that it left behind. Now, when it comes to the world, that's a little different. They're not going to forgive you. The stain that's going to be left, you got to serve your time for the crime that you've committed and there needs to be some form of reciprocity, some, some form of repayment. And even after you repay, you're going to be marked and seen as a, a, a a bank robber that's no longer robbing banks. In the kingdom of heaven, it's not like that. You're going to be forgiven, but you need to let God know what it is that you were guilty of. Okay, you may have been found in an adulterous relationship. You may have been with a, with a married man or a married woman and, and, and having a relationship with them on the side. Now you broke that relationship off and you're no longer you know, doing things like that. You still need to tell God what it was that you were doing so that you could be not only forgiven of it, but cleansed of the stain that it left behind on your garment and on your soul. So you have to be honest about it. You have to, you have to reveal things that you don't want to have to reveal. You have to let God know what your deepest, darkest secrets that because it's your way of letting them know what it is that you've done wrong. And then you have to, you know, God has to cleanse you. You know, you have to repent and you have to confess. God is going to forgive and he is going to cleanse. If you do your part, God does his part. You don't do your part, then you don't give God a, uh, any reason to do his part. Amen. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Lastly, go with me real quick to Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. We're going to read about the Holy Spirit coming upon the disciples and come. Not only did it come upon the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it came inside of them and it gave them the ability to speak in a foreign foreign language or in foreign languages. That ability was given to them so that they can reach the worshipers that were there on this particular day of Pentecost the various nationalities or the various cultures that were there, they were able to hear their native language being spoken of by the disciples. The Holy Ghost was trying to get their attention. Once the Holy Ghost had their attention, uh, Peter began to minister the gospel to them. So the first, the, the Holy Ghost was poured out upon the disciples. Once the Holy Ghost came upon the disciples, it came inside of them and gave them the ability to speak in a foreign language. 
those who were there for this time of observation, this, this Pentecost, they heard their native language being spoken of by the disciples, so they, were, they had their attention. Once they heard their native language, Peter began to minister the gospel to them. And here's what Peter says, beginning at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. Lord meaning King of kings, Lord of lords. Christ meaning the Messiah, the one from God, the Holy One from God. Peter goes on to tell them that their lifestyle, surely the people that were there were not the ones to drive the nails through the, the hands and the feet of Jesus as he was crucified on the cross, but their lifestyle made them just as complicit as those that had crucified Jesus. Okay, Now that goes to us as well. You may not have been the ones there that crucified Jesus to the cross, but your lifestyle that are, that's found in rebellion and in rejection make you just as complicit and guilty as those that had done that. So you will be charged accordingly. Okay. Now, Peter's audience, when they heard his sermon, when they heard this, they were convicted or they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So when Peter heard this, I'm sorry, when Peter's audience, when they heard his message, they were convicted. They were pricked in their heart. And they wanted to know what can they do to right the wrong. When you hear the word of truth being expounded to you and you have a conviction in your heart, God is revealing to you what's broken about you, what's out of line between you and him. And he's giving you that opportunity to work on it, to, to, to resolve the matter so that there would be peace between you and him. Amen. So God is revealing some things through conviction, okay? Peter's audience, they were convicted, and they asked, what can we do to get things on the right footing, on the right path? Peter gives them the answer in verse 38. He says, repent. We talked about repentance, turning away from your sins once and for all. Then Peter says, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So let's talk a little bit about uh, baptism. Jesus uh, was crucified on the cross and then he died. He gave, he gave up the ghost or he laid down his life. He was taken down off the cross and he was laid to rest in the tomb. So he was laid to rest for three days and three nights. After three days and three nights, he was brought back to life. So he was laid to rest in the tomb. And then after three days and three nights, he was resurrected from the dead. When we go through the ceremony of baptism and we're being laid down into the water fully submerged, we're being laid to rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we come up out of the water, we're being resurrected in Jesus Christ. Our old man goes down into the water. Our new man comes up out of the water. We are buried in Christ Jesus. We are resurrected in Christ Jesus. Amen. This is why you want to have the ceremony done. Your old man goes down. Your new man comes up. All your sins are washed away. You've been washed of your sins. Amen. God forgives you of your sins, but you have to be cleansed of your sin. You have to be washed away. And this is the washing away of it. This is that ceremony of baptism. This is the ceremony of baptism that we go through. Amen. So you want to make sure that you, you get it done. You want to make sure. And I know we live in a, uh, a post um, I can't say post-COVID because we're still living a crisis of COVID, if you will. Um, and people are cautious not to want to put themselves in position or in danger to come in conflict with others or to come in contact, I should say, with others that, that may be exposed to this COVID virus. Uh, but I tell you that you are still required to get this ceremony done. And if God gives you power and a path to get it done, you have to get it done. I would suggest that you would pray to God and ask him to send someone to you or to send you somewhere to have the, the, the ceremony performed. Amen. You definitely want to get it done. 
And then uh, in verse 38, Peter tells them, remember, they want to know what can they do to right the wrong. Peter tells them to repent. And then they, then Peter tells them to go through the ceremony of baptism. And then Peter says, you can expect to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Just as, as the disciples received the gift of the Spirit, so shall we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? For, your, for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. I love that verse because not only is it saying that you're Gentile and you can still receive salvation, but, it's all, but to me, it's also saying that no matter how grievous the sin is, the, the blood of Jesus is, is strong enough to cleanse you and to atone for your sins. So no matter how wrong you, no matter what you did to mess up, and a lot of people don't agree with it because people look at the sin of, of itself. People look at various sins being heinous in, in its actions. And then I believe that to be the case. A lot of sins are heinous. But then you're also saying that the blood of Jesus is not strong enough to cleanse anyone from these earthly sins or these fleshly sins that have been committed, no matter how heinous they are. And I, I take issue with that. The blood of Jesus is enough. It's enough and then some. But the blood of Jesus only has power if the person repents of the sin. The blood of Jesus, if you don't, if you don't repent, it's not going to continue to cleanse you. You understand what I'm saying? It's not going to work in, when you're in an unrepented state. It works when you have repented, when you've turned away from the sin. When you're in an unrepented state, the blood is, is, is it's not going to do you any good if you haven't let go of the sins. Do you understand what I'm saying? Basically, if you want to be forgiven, you have to stop committing a sin so that you can be forgiven. Otherwise, God took the, the, the God removed Adam and Eve out of the garden. Uh, why? Because he didn't want them to remain in a, in a, in a sinful state. And, and eating from the tree, uh, 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 the tree of life to where they would have been eternally sinful. So you can't have, so, so God removed them out so that they couldn't have eternal life while they were living in a sinful state. Do you understand what I'm saying? So therefore the blood in itself, it's not going to allow you to continue to be forgiven over sins that you haven't repented of. So that you can live, You're, you, God is not going to have you to live forever in an unrepented state. You, at some point in time, you either go, you know, going to repent, or you're going to be condemned. You know, but you can't keep using the blood to continue to sin, and that's the problem. Uh, going on with this, with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this godless or lawless generation. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. God was adding to the size of our family. Peter told them that it's incumbent upon you to remove yourself from places and people that mean you no good, that, that are unrighteous in all of their ways. You have to separate yourself from them. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. Whatever God did to get them to the point that they've received and obtained salvation, they did their part to make sure that they maintained it by constantly praying, by uh, fellowshipping, by studying the word, uh, and uh, uh, by breaking bread one with another, they made sure that they did their part. So when you don't take your foot off the gas, you continue your forward momentum. Uh, once you begin to slow down and you begin to stop, be before you know it, you're falling away, you're backsliding. So you want to continue moving forward uh, within your walk with God through Jesus Christ. Fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. All that believed were together and had all things common. They sold their possessions and good, and they parted them to all men as every man had need. They continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. 
and the Lord added to the church daily uh, such as should be saved. So God was, we was, God was showing us how their lives were in order. There wasn't any dissimulation. There wasn't any uh, dissension. They had, they all were together on the same accord. They loved one another and they were mindful of one another's needs. Amen. And they did what they could to support one another. They lived in fellowship and in unity. Eternal God, we take this opportunity to thank you for being the God that of justice, the God of righteousness, the God of peace and our salvation. We thank you for long suffering with us, holding back your wrath and giving us your grace and your mercies. And in doing so, Father, you have been calling people out of captivity, people out of darkness, into the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have been saving and adding to the signs of our family. And each person, each believer that you integrate into the body, you fill them with fruits of the Spirit. You fill them with your Spirit and you give them the fruits of the Spirit as well as gifts and callings. To this, Lord God, we say thank you. Every person that you save is the expansion of our family. It's another person that's not condemned. It's another soldier. It's another brother and another sister in the body of Christ. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for creating us. And thank you for establishing a path for us to live eternally with you. We pray for those that you have brought out of the world and have brought into the kingdom of God that they too will be filled with your spirit, that you would send them to places of worship, that they may be baptized, to help them to understand the word of God and to send them into territories to help lead others to the Lord Jesus Christ who leads us to the throne of God, that we may inherit your grace. Father, I thank you for your mercies and your compassion, which are tender, sweet, I thank you for the gift of eternal life. Above all and moreover, I thank you for the Lord Jesus. We pray for those that have come into the kingdom of God, that Jesus would come into their hearts and remain there. We pray for them that they would be filled with the Spirit and that they would be vessels to bring you great honor. We pray that we would never, ever tell the Lord that we will not obey but we pray that we are always seen as obeying and going where you send us and speaking what you tell us. To God be the glory forever and ever. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and give thanks. Folks, I thank you for allowing my family and I to be a part of your Bible study. I thank you for extending your prayers and your proceeds for the support of this ministry as, as well as my family and myself. I, I really thank you for your support of the kingdom. I encourage you to continue to seek the face of the Lord and to believe him, uh, to be not weary in well-doing, amen? Always have faith in God, no matter what your situation is like, amen? I loose unto you uh, these blessings, which is of our benediction, Numbers chapter 6, and we were taking a look at verses 24 through 26. Make sure that you have no unrepented sin within your life. Make sure you've repented of all your sins, uh, that you're in right standings with God, that you may receive these blessings that shall be bestowed upon you. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. I loose that on you that you would receive it, that you prosper, that you be well, and that you give thanks. Receive it in Jesus' name, for it's loosed unto you. God bless you. God keep you always. We love you, and again, thank you.